Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this webinar from St Dunstan's College on girls in education, co-education and busting the myths. It's really lovely to have so many of you here tonight, be that prospective parents or current parents or fellow educationalists. I've spent the last eight years leading uh, a co-ed school here in South East London, and I've met hundreds of parents um, who are interested in the right place for their child to be educated. And the question that comes back time and time again to me is, I just don't know. I don't know whether a single sex is right or whether co-education is right for my child. And so it seemed only right for us that we start to do better at educating our parents in the very real and tangible benefits of co-education. We see them. We see them day in, day out. And I say that as someone who was educated in a single sex environment and spent much of my career in a single sex environment. We very, very much see those benefits. But I think we need to do better as educators working in co-educational establishment at helping you understand what those benefits are. If I look at single sex schools, and in particular, I have to say the girls schools, they do a very, very good job of celebrating the advantages of girls only education. And I think we need to do better. And if anything tangible can come out of this webinar, it would be that I work with other co-educational schools to start commissioning work, research and evidence to show in very concrete and true terms the benefits that we all see. I'm very grateful to my team who have given up this evening to talk with you. Um, you're going to hear from six of them and they're going to reflect for around five minutes each uh, on a particular myth that is out there around co-education and, and girls in co-education. Um, there will, of course, be some time at the end for questions. Do type them into the chat as they come to you. I won't be able to answer them all, but I will do my best to tackle a few of them at the end of this presentation. But I really, really hope it is of interest to you. And once again, thank you so much for tuning in uh, on this November evening and listen, listening to our reflections as educationalists in the co-education sector. I'm now going to pass over to Laura Whitwood, Head of Junior School at St Dunstan's. So good evening, everyone. The myth that I am going to be looking at this evening is that girls in co-education feel less confident to put themselves forward for leadership opportunities. When it comes to women in leadership, it doesn't take much time seeking research online to realise how extensive coverage has been in this on this important topic in recent years. Within just 20 minutes of looking into the current picture, I learned that according to an IBM study completed this year, the number of female senior vice presidents and both middle and senior managers has decreased significantly since the beginning of the pandemic. A report from FactSet conducted also this year found that only 5.5% of CEOs among the 3,000 companies in the analysis were women and that only one in four organisations said that advancing women is a top 10 business priority. A 2016 study entitled Barriers and Biases, the Status of Women in Leadership, highlighted that only 29% of private sector senior level workers were female, concluding that women are much less likely than men to be in leadership positions in universities, businesses, courts, unions and religious institutions, male leaders outnumber female leaders by wide margins. And finally, according to the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report, it will still be another 170 years until women achieve economic parity on a global scale. So what is it then that we can do to speed the process up? It doesn't take much time looking at the conclusions drawn from the range of different studies out there to fully appreciate why getting leadership positions in school right for young girls now can only improve the current gender imbalance that we see in the world of work. I don't think that anyone can dispute the absolute necessity of empowering girls to embrace leadership opportunities. And it is our duty to develop their confidence to lead, to feel that they can inspire and influence others 
and to ensure that we teach all of our pupils the skills that they need to thrive as successful leaders of the future. Yet, am I going to push the idea that the most successful female leaders will always come from co-educational settings? Well, as a woman in leadership, uh, in a leadership position myself, who went to an all-girls school, that doesn't present the most positive picture of my leadership. But what I would say of my own experience is that it comes down to creating a culture of building self-confidence for young girls with staff prioritising the need to develop a resilient and motivated pupil body and also engendering an open mind about who is actually best placed to achieve impressive results within each leadership role. The idea that girls are less likely to put themselves forward for leadership positions in a co-educational setting is certainly far from what we see here at St Dunstan's, with girls as young as year two uh, feeling just as confident as the boys to put their name forward for leadership positions, a situation which we see all the way through to our sixth form where pupils consider if they have the skills necessary to become successful prefects. And why is this? Well, it really comes down to our culture as a liberal forward thinking school that's unafraid to challenge gender stereotypes. We are ambitious in our aims for all of our pupils from the very earliest stage of education. This undoubtedly has a hugely positive impact upon our young leaders. And what is it that we want? from our young people, will we want them to get an accurate flavour for the real world that they will one day become a part of? In a rapidly evolving and developing modern world, their future is unknown to them. The leadership roles that they may pursue may not even exist yet. It's therefore extremely important that we ensure that we instill the skills necessary in order that they can thrive in their future. A culture where community truly embraces the positive contribution that each child can make, regardless of their gender, is essential in building their self-confidence. It is in this fully inclusive environment that children are able to recognise the positive contribution that they are able to make in their school community. Now, one of the most significant advantages of co-education is that pupils learn to cooperate with many different people from an early age. The workplace is not made up of one gender and it never will be. And therefore, those who attend a co-educational school are introduced to this type of collaboration with different people long before they may wish to put themselves forward for a leadership position. Pupils are aware of each other's strengths and their character and as such can develop the ability to really consider carefully when it is the right time for them to take on a particular position of responsibility. And when they vote for pupils in different leadership positions, they are able and encouraged to seek who has the skills necessary in order to thrive within that role. In a co-educational school, pupils are able to develop a strong self of self, uh, a strong sense of self, embrace who they are, uh, develop strength of character, and they will therefore be well prepared for a diverse world where people of every gender play an important role. It's really in this kind of inclusive environment that they are able to learn about having respect for all of their peers and they're exposed to a diverse range of viewpoints and also have the opportunity to break down gender stereotypes in order that they can all succeed as potential leaders of the future. So I am going to pass over now to Gemma Davies, who is our head of lower school. Thank you and good evening. Um, so I'm going to be addressing the myth uh, that girls in co-education are less likely to choose a STEM pathway. So the message is out there loud and clear. We want more women in STEM and I wholeheartedly agree. Um, a study by STEM Women published in January this year tells us that the total STEM of the total STEM workforce, 24% are women. And although the number of women in engineering has doubled in the past decade, it still only makes up 10%. Slightly more positively, science professionals do have greater parity with 46% being women. But why is this important and why does it matter? Well, we know that women are innovative, curious, gifted, 
creative thinkers that make a significant contribution to science and engineering. We want to see women making that difference in society. So what role do schools have to play in supporting um, young women on a STEM pathway? Well, studies often point to the uptake of STEM subjects at A-level as a concern and a key factor in the low numbers of women that we see in STEM careers. The Institute of Physics have carried out a series of studies on this. However, the statistics don't necessarily show the full picture. One of the comparisons made um, compared co-educational maintained schools with independent single sex schools. So we really need to be sure that we're comparing like for like in order to make valid conclusions. One study that was complete, uh, completed in a school that changed from a single sex to co-educational setting, it looked at data across 10 year groups over the course of an academic year and it actually found that the girls in the single sex setting showed a greater tendency to be stereotyped than those in a co-educational setting. So what's my experience as a science teacher and as a senior leader in a co-educational setting? Well, I see every day innovative, curious girls ready to become the next generation of scientists, engineers, mathematicians. And I'm pleased to see that here at St Dunstan's we have girls studying every STEM subject to A-level, including physics, maths, further maths and computer science. And in fact, we actually have more girls studying A-level chemistry than boys. So how do we continue to ensure that girls in a co-educational setting are engaged with STEM? Well, firstly, I think we need to look for role models. One study found that when girls had textbook with pictures of female scientists in, they performed better than their counterparts who had textbooks with only pictures of male scientists. So we need to ensure that our next generation of female scientists, engineers and mathematicians have positive female role models. At St Dunstan's, our students have outstanding female science teachers in, the STEM, in STEM subjects and outstanding female STEM teachers in a variety of leadership positions. They can see themselves as female scientists reflected amongst the staff body. But having female teachers and leaders within STEM is not enough. We need to ensure that we create space in the curriculum to represent the achievements of women, to celebrate the contribution that they have made to science and engineering. For example, when I teach about the effect of pesticides on ecosystems, we study the work of Rachel Carson and the impact of her book Silent Spring. We also need to have student leadership so that our youngest students can look up to our sixth form students and know the girls studying STEM at A-levels. Having a broad, diverse and enriching co-curricular programme for the STEM subjects that has opportunities for vertical integration really helps our younger girls to see the doors for a STEM pathway are open to them. We also need to give our girls the individual support that they need to realise the next step in their journey. In my time at the college, um, we, I've seen us send young women to university to study a wide range of STEM subjects, including biochemistry, engineering, biomedical science, medicine, veterinary science, physics, physics with astrophysics, um, just to name a few. Um, they were encouraged and supported by both the Futures team and the STEM departments. And I think having academic societies to extend and enrich their education, mentors within the departments to fuel their ambition to move into STEM careers was really helpful to those young women. So I think with carefully considered advice and guidance about academic pathways in STEM, girls can be supported to move into STEM courses and careers. So with the right systems in place, there is no reason why we can't continue to move towards gender parity in STEM careers. And there's absolutely no reason why girls from a co-educational setting cannot be at the forefront of this. I'm now going to hand over to Danny Gower, who's the Assistant Head Co-Curricular at St Dunstan's. Good evening, everyone. So girls in co-education don't achieve comparable sporting success. I guess the truth in this statement really does hinge on how you define sporting success. Is it about competitive performances and school results? Win loss ratios for our school sporting teams. Before I go any further, please don't think for one minute that I don't see winning as important. The quest to win is a noble one, and let's be honest, it's more fun than losing. Experiencing both is an important part of a young person's development, and it only comes through meaningful, well-planned competition. I've learned from experience that no matter how many times you tell a young person that it isn't about winning, they don't hear you anyway. 
So how about numbers of pupils that end up in an elite sporting environment? It's very marketable indeed for a school, but if your sporting programme is designed around achieving this aim, then what proportion of your student body will this actually be relevant to? Sport, physical activity and its potential for improving young people's mental and physical health is far too important in today's society to be exclusive rather than inclusive. So what's the easiest way to achieve the above, the above if that is the way you define success? Well, it's probably a relent relentless diet of team games, high training load and volume, and something that looks like a traditional model for school sport. Terminally focus on single sports on a two or three sport rotation. What that looks like is intensive 10 to 12 week blocks of training and preparation for when Saturday finally comes, often delivered unsurprisingly by the people for whom this system worked. This model has been particularly successful when you compare it against the measures that I described above and therefore particularly difficult to move away from for large single sex schools where a larger player pool is obviously advantageous. But what about the majority that aren't suited to high level competition? In a system that measures success by competitive sporting outcomes, they quickly become the have nots and those negative early associations are difficult to shake. Even for those that are, the evolution of professional club sport means that talent is being picked up and identified earlier and earlier, which contradicts everything that we know about long-term athlete development and the dangers associated with early specialization. I've worked closely with academy coaches who've likened it to throwing eggs against a wall to be left with the few that just don't break. Think of a typical week for a young school netballer, a two hour session with a club and then a two hour county session taking up evenings midweek, club match Saturday and then a county game on Sunday. You've then got an additional session thrown in with a Super League franchise in addition to your 12 week school block. One games afternoon, two training sessions and a fixture each week. Morning and lunchtime sessions thrown in on top of that, probably in the quest for successful competitive outcomes. The picture that I describe isn't unusual and it's probably even further exaggerated in other traditional team sports that have more established pro club academy networks. I've seen too many young, talented athletes burn out and end up disengaging with competitive sport altogether. In the early days of co-education, schools started with more of the same rather than carving out a real point of difference. Schools were either open about operating with your sort of separate boys and girls departments and they were structured accordingly, or they did so by stealth under the guise of different, differing sporting pathways. Girls play netball, hockey and rounders, and the boys follow a similar path, but with different sports. As the sporting landscapes evolved for girls in particular, throw in a little bit of football and cricket, but never in such a way that it would compromise your existing sporting programs. The question I'd ask is, can we have the courage to go a step further? What if the sporting offering was co-educational in nature and not just in name. All of a sudden you double the number of sports that young people have access to. Emphasize breadth and diversity of opportunity in our sporting curricula and co-curricular programs to give each child a more varied experience and the freedom to embark on their own unique journey. Mixed sport has to be a fundamental part of this, with mixed gender fixtures against like-minded schools a part of the package to run alongside existing boys and girls fixtures. 
clearly this needs to be carefully planned and thought through in order to be delivered safely and fairly but it could form the basis of an exciting and ever broader sporting offering that engages a wider spectrum of pupils in sport and physical activity. More young people engaged and benefiting from those positive early experiences, that sounds like success to me. So I'm now going to hand over to Emma Latham, who is our Director of Studies at the College. Thank you. Thank you, Danny, and good evening, everyone. As you can see, the myth I'll be looking at today is girls perform better academically in single sex schools. This is a statement I've heard a lot through my career as a teacher, and it's often backed up by because they're away from distraction or they're able to focus purely on their learning or they're away from the pressures of gender stereotyping. Having taught in state funded single sex schools, both a selective and a comprehensive, attended a single sex independent school and now as a teacher in a co-educational independent school, I have a unique perspective on the aforementioned statements. My experience as a former head of science and now the director of studies is that it really doesn't make a difference. I've sent girls off to the most competitive universities to study the most competitive courses in both environments. And I can't say as a teacher, the girls in my classes are disadvantaged due to the presence of boys. In fact, in the majority of my classes, the attainment and value added of the two are very similar. But that's just anecdotal. And as the students in my Global Perspectives class would say, I need to do some research to put across a balanced argument. So I began researching into girls' education and I found many studies supporting single sex education for girls and repeating the sentiments I'd mentioned at the beginning. But with my Global Perspectives brain on, one of the major difficulties I found when considering these studies and addressing the effect on student learning is non-equivalent group comparisons. Single sex schools tend to be independent or grammar schools, which are more selective in both teachers and students than the co-educational comprehensive, which is the case for the majority of schools in the UK. This led me to a particularly powerful 1996 study by Marsh and Rowe on the effects of single sex and mixed sex mathematics classes within a co-educational school. There, the researchers were able to randomise students and teachers into single sex or mixed sex classes. In this study, they found that across all measures of attainment, there were no instances of gains for girls in girls only classes or boys in boys only classes being significantly more positive than gains for girls or boys in mixed sex classes. John Hattie points to this in his book, Visible Learning, a synthesis of over 800 meta-analyses relating to achievement, where he concludes, overall, there's very little compelling evidence of a compositional effect related to whether a class is single or mixed sex. And when considering the national picture in the UK, we can turn to the Department of Education and the Key Stage 4 Attainment 8 scores of girls and boys. For those of you who don't spend their time staring at data like I do, Attainment 8 measures the achievement of students across eight qualifications, including mathematics, English, three English baccalaureate subjects, and a further three qualifications. Looking at the average Attainment 8 score by people characteristics for state funded schools in 2019, chosen for obvious COVID reasons, the attainment gap between boys and girls is relatively small with girls outperforming boys by only 5.5 points, and the majority of these schools will be mixed. So what does make a difference to the attainment of students? For me, it is the culture of the school and the focus on individualised learning and progress. When put into the hands of an excellent teacher, all students in a class can make exceptional progress based on well-planned and structured lessons with regular and insightful feedback, then the makeup of a class makes no difference. So what are we doing at St Dunstan's to ensure students experience individualised learning? The answer to that is a lot, from regular learning walks, continual feedback during and outside of lessons, to a well-structured curriculum that considers the broad range of students in our community. My view, 
when all these conditions are met, the makeup of the class becomes irrelevant. I'm going to pass over to Alex Brewer now, who is our head of sick form. Uh, thanks, Emma. Um, the myth that I am going to deal with is that girls are better prepared for post-school lives um, by being in single sex environments. Um, the great question in education is always this. Are we preparing our daughters and sons for the future as it is now or for a future that is not yet come into being? The question of women in education brings this into sharp focus. It is well known that women outrank men in terms of educational achievement throughout their educational lives, independent of the type of schooling that they received until at least the age of 21. Despite this fact, if you went back to 1985, you would find that only 45% of girls holding A-levels went into higher education. Society as it was then wasn't preparing girls for the lives they live now. It took the educational system an entire rethink in its processes and values in order to transform this situation to where we are today. Namely, that in 2020, 68% of that population of girls now go on to higher education, and by 2025, that's projected to be at 71%. All schools reimagined the pathways into STEM, reshaped the career goals of women in work, and altered who and how girls and boys held positions of power in the educational structures that fostered them. St Dunstan's works centrally in this tradition with a forward-looking curriculum that reimagines who the girls and boys of the future might be. This is a two-way process. Just as we encourage girls into taking and envisaging um, positions in traditional masculine bastions like maths and engineering, so too is there an equal push to envisage boys in the traditional feminine bastions like the arts and languages. It is why our college is proud to end each year on um, our arts festival, just at the very moment when many other schools are winding down and shutting up their shop for summer. What will the workplace of the future look like? Well, even though women obtain stronger educational results through to the age of 21, the consequences of that difference does not at the moment continue. In 2018, the degree outcomes for those achieving first or two ones stood at 76.5% uh, female and 20 and 72.4% male in the UK. However, the proportion of that same group going into uh, professional full time work um, stood at 49.5% female as against 51.2% male. And the wage gap that is unfortunately already apparent at that juncture, at that juncture, and though the width width of that gap varies by profession, the wage gap remains depressingly study, a stubborn between the genders. But society lags behind education just as it did 50 years ago. Now we have a generation of daughters whose mothers went to university and they are expecting to go to university and have co careers comparable to their mothers. We support that change by ensuring the women of this school are given the opportunity to be to be in roles that they desire, not just that those that wider society expects them to hold. It is why the St Dunstan Sixth Form Diploma supports the real independence of choice that comes from offering um, the option to take, for example, one of the hundreds of different six week courses we have an offer from astrophysics to eco building design to the anthropology of Japanese culture. Our diploma scholars visit the archives of opera writers and the workstations of nuclear power operators and all of the sixth form students have the chance to take sign language courses or to train in the workplace as baristas, for example. Our prefect team manifests the virtues of genders working together in leading the school. Our last four heads of school have been two young women and two young men and their deputies and support teams also reflect that gender diversity. It is seeing and experiencing this practical reality of the lives of those in the mixed workplaces of the coming future that enables our girls and boys to envisage the more equal future that is surely the path of the next generation. And with that, I will now hand over to Jade McClellan, who is our Deputy Head Pastoral. 
Thank you, Alex. Um, so good evening, everybody. I'm going to be looking at our final myth, which is that girls in co-education are affected by the bad behaviour of boys. Um, so I suppose there cannot be a parent in the UK today who feels unaffected by the recent sequence of events we've seen uh, that started with the Me Too and Time's Up campaigns, followed by the tragic murder of Sarah Everard and later Sabina Nessa, amongst many other women. Um, and ending with the Everyone's Invited revelations and Ofsted inquiries into sexual harassment and sexual abuse in schools. And one reaction to these events, completely understandably given the imperative to protect our children from harm, may be to consider that the safest option is simply to keep boys and girls apart. According to the myths, boys cannot be trusted to leave girls alone. Girls will be distracted, either by the poor behaviour of boys, by the desire to seem attractive to boys, or by the outright abusive behaviour of boys. Unfortunately, this narrative denigrates the reputation of both our young men and our young women, for whom we should have higher expectations. As someone who has daily conversations with parents of teenage boys and girls, and many parents who have one of each, they want them to be educated together, to have the opportunity to discuss these issues together, and to find solutions to them, together. If there is one thing that the current thorny issues in society demonstrate, it is that polarisation and separation do not bring resolution. Cancel culture and no platforming only serve to reinforce entrenched positions. And we consider ourselves fortunate to work in co-education and to be able to discuss these critical issues with students of both sexes. Just in the past six months, we have discussed FGM, domestic abuse, compassionate understanding between men, coercive control, male and female infertility and gender stereotypes. We have had male and female students discussing these topics together, learning with and from one another. In all of the ways you've heard so far this evening, we are preparing our female students for top universities, for careers in STEM if that is what they want, for taking on leadership positions, not only in school but also in society, becoming the CEOs of the future. But we also recognise the need for male leaders who are allies and who would be comfortable, for example, endorsing or even proposing a menopause or breastfeeding policy to the board. The work we do with our students of both sexes here is preparing them with actual knowledge that they can draw upon for this shared future. A 1986 study by Harris surveying over 500 students from both single sex and co-educational schools found that the majority considered co-educational schools led to a more natural attitude towards the opposite sex, resulted in a greater number of friendships with members of the opposite sex, and students stated that their school had had a positive impact on their interpersonal skills with members of both sexes. Now, if this was true in 1986, how much more pertinent is it now when children of all schools in any given local area, whether they attend single sex schools or co-ed, will be communicating together on Snapchat, on TikTok and on Instagram. How much more important is it now that children have the experience of working together day to day in real life, of seeing each other as individuals, warts and all, rather than predominantly meeting online with its associated artifice, increased likelihood of reinforcing division and gender stereotypes and consequent narrow lens on the world. Judith Gill states in her book, Beyond the Great Divide, Single Sex or Co-Education, that we are somewhat doomed in education as we are trying to prepare our children for the future based on our own experiences in the past. There are two immediate conclusions that leap out here. The obvious point is that the future for which we are preparing our students certainly isn't single sex. But more importantly, co-education has the opportunity to allow young men and young women to work together to shape a shared vision of equality and mutual respect, rather than growing and dreaming separately and then coming together in the workplace to discover that the dreams were different all along. At St Dunstan's, we first of all recognise that high expectations for behaviour benefit everybody, ensuring that we have common lesson expectations, that students cannot opt out of participation, that we praise the behaviour we do want to see, are among a range of strategies that ensure everybody in the classroom, boys and girls, can thrive and learn free from distractions. We challenge all forms of discrimination and harassment and look at how we can move society on through the work of our diapason, which focuses on progress in attitudes in a number of different areas, including sex and gender. 
we have confident students who will and do speak out if any negative events do occur. They know what is right and they support each other based on a moral standpoint, not based on boys versus girls. We have girls supporting boys producing drama about male mental health and boys supporting girls producing drama about misogyny. Earlier this year, I had male and female sixth formers asked to meet me to see what they could do to help tackle attitudes towards women in society. Just a few small examples, but I hope they give you an insight as to why we all feel so privileged to work in co-education today. I'm going to hand back to the headmaster, Nick Hewlett, uh, for the Q&A. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to the team there for talking us through those myths. And I hope you were as inspired as I was by what I thought was just really insightful reflection around the power and importance of co-education for young women today. Uh, thank you to those of you who have submitted your questions. I am very conscious that we only got five minutes on each of those very important topics. So we have decided as a community that in Lent term, so that's from January, we're going to host a number of seminars on those very topics to go into more detail and you'll be invited in um, to take part in those seminars. So do keep an eye out on our social media channels and on our website as they're advertised. I can't get through all of your questions. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry, but I have got a few which I will pick up on now. The first one I have, and I think probably this is best tackled by Jade, just to give you a heads up, Jade. Uh, and it says, I've heard from other schools that girls in co-ed schools regularly suffer sexual harassment from boys, for example, sort of bra snapping, upskirting, etc. And I'd be really interested in your experience of this at St Dunstan's. Jade, that is one for you. Uh, yep, OK. And um, so I suppose, first of all, just to reassure anybody who might be a prospective parent that we have been following um, the Ofsted and ISI recommendations and those have all been implemented. Those are for all schools um, operating in the UK. Um, and we have to acknowledge the truth that women and girls face these challenges every day um, in their interactions, whether they're on the tube or at the bus stop. So unfortunately, that is why, um, referring back to my earlier comments, we need to make sure boys and girls are working together to make sure these inequalities don't happen. Uh, I have to say we are quite fortunate to have not experienced um, any trends in terms of sexual harassment in this way. Uh, we do tr track any sort of interpersonal issues between students and uh, look for trends whether they be uh, with race or sex and gender or, you know, all the different things that one might expect. And we haven't seen a trend uh, connected with anything between boys and girls. And I think our students wouldn't really tolerate it, to be honest. Um, they're very aware of their rights. Um, they're very forthright at coming forward um, if they feel that their rights have been infringed. And so although there have been um, you know, there has been the odd issue come up over the years. Really, those have been one offs. Students have come forward and denounced them uh, straight away and we've dealt with them as any other behaviour issue. But we are very fortunate and I know we are very fortunate at St Dunstan's that we don't have uh, any worrying trends in this area. Question. The next one, just to give you a heads up, I think it's probably most appropriate tackled by Gemma Davies, head of lower school. Is it true that girls and boys in co-ed schools tend to stick with each other by gender and don't mix, uh, particularly in social time. So uh, Gemma, are you happy with that one? Uh, yes, um, so I'm happy to answer that question. Um, so obviously I'm very lucky to have been in um, pastoral leadership uh, in a co-ed setting for um, nearly a decade now, just over a decade. Um, and actually what's delightful is actually we really don't see that at all. Um, if I walk across the playground, if I walk around the fields at break time and lunchtime, I see children kicking balls together. So having a little kickabout or maybe they're sat on benches having a chat um, in our refectory. Um, we see them sitting, having lunch together and, and talking and sharing that social time. So that's definitely not a pattern that we see here. Um, and I think the probably the reason that I think if we think about the lessons and um, within the lessons, teachers really encourage them to get engaged with group work and paired work and work together with each other. So I think those um, 
those relationships that they start to build with each other in the in the classrooms really filter out into that social time and then I think the next layer is the co-curricular side of things um, if I think about the co-curricular activities that I'm involved in I see really amazing teamwork um, between our boys and girls uh, in that and I think you can't help but have those relationships filter out to their social time um, so I would say that's definitely not a pattern that we see um, and it's just lovely to see them all interacting with each other uh, across break time and lunchtime. The next one looks like an Emma question because it's on the academic side and this is do girls tend to be academically shy in a mixed school? Emma are you happy to take that one? Yeah I'm happy to take that one Nick thank you and um, I suppose briefly no do we have academically shy girls of course we do we have an equal number of them though to equally sh equally shy boys and um, i think it's really about how do you foster that academic resilience that academic curiosity in a constructive way through our curriculum and through our teaching within lessons and um, that's really the most important thing and that's the same for all students so how do we go about doing that well partly it's embedded in our curriculum so we actively teach as part of our timetable time within the day skills like critical thinking skills like presentation skills debate and um, constructing argument and um, and we allow a safe space for students to, to get things wrong that can be something that all students struggle with the idea that they must be right and there is a right answer and of course we know as, as we grow up and we get older that that's not always the case so for us it's particularly important to embed that throughout we also focus on improving students through their, their learning behaviors rather than just their pure attainment and i think that really really helps with developing students that are not shy academically that are aware of their weaknesses and how to improve them that awareness is so critical for being a constructive learner for the future. So we deliberately focus on how are you engaging in the subject? What is your response to your feedback? Do you get a piece of work and look at it, run away from your wrong answers, or do you stride toward them and think, how can I improve? So sum up, no, I don't think it's specifically a problem for girls, but we are developing in all our students. I've got one here on sport in particular what about high performing sporty girls do you think they suffer with this alternative sports program um, that you propose which i think is talks to danny's um presentation so danny um no i i i honestly don't um i mentioned burnout when i was talking earlier and it's a very real risk that comes with physiological and psychological implications and it really is a direct consequence of excessive training loads and an overemphasis on winning far too early on um, there's also absolutely no doubt and the, the research bears it out all of the early work was sort of Ballyway and Higgs but from then all of the work on long term athlete development is in support for maintaining a multi sport approach for as long as possible uh, because we end up building more creative, flexible, adaptable and resilient performers. Don't don't get me wrong. What I'm proposing doesn't ignore that that top couple of percent um, schools clearly have a responsibility to support those talented athletes but that needs to come in other ways it can come through really really strong partnerships with the high performing club environments um, because at the end of the day they're, they're best set up to deliver sport specific high performing programs that's why they exist um, and then the in-school support becomes about athlete mentoring because we have an oversight of all aspects of the young people's lives in a way that their clubs don't because we have day-to-day -day contact and strong relationships with families uh, ultimately the journey to elite sport is long and tough and if young people are going to succeed not just in sport but in all other aspects of their lives then the support that schools can provide outside of participation in that sport is absolutely paramount and that should be a focus for all schools. One more question which is um, is very much around junior school to senior school transition which I know will be on many of your minds at the moment 
Um, and this quite specific question here, how can I prepare my child who's in a junior school, but currently in an all girls junior school? So this is for Laura, I think, in an all girls junior school to comfortably make the transition over to a co-ed senior school. So Laura, over to you. Oh, thank you, Nick. Sorry, I'm not sure what happened there tech issues wise. Uh, yes, definitely a question for me. Um, certainly from my experience, uh, children joining our school uh, at any point of entry um, settle really well. Our children are friendly, they're really welcoming, they're used to new, new faces at any point in the school year, so it generally isn't an issue for us at all. Uh, nonetheless, there are certain things that you can do to ensure that the transition is as smooth as it possibly can be for them. Uh, I would recommend that you really think about the differences um, that they may encounter. Don't just expect them to know what a co-educational setting might look like. Um, from my experience of going to a single sex school, um, my, it was very easy for me to make friendships that were, were just like me. All of my friends um, had lots of similarities uh, to, to the person that I was. And so when I then went to university and then joined St Dunstan's where there were men in the leadership team, can you, can you believe it? It took a little bit of time to adjust. So with that in mind, I think familiar, familiarise your, uh, your child with what a co-educational setting might look like. That's crucial. Don't just expect them to know. Um, and also begin to find opportunities for them to broaden their friendship group. So really think hard about what their areas of interest might be and then go and find a mixed out of school club that they can attend um, where they can learn in advance uh, of starting in a co-educational setting to inter interact with children of different genders. Um, so encourage them to make friends with the boys and girls in those clubs to broaden their circle as they already clearly have an interest in common by attending that club. Um, and encourage them to get used to spending time with a range of different children and really learn to enjoy that social time and how it might be different to some of those friendships that they have in school currently. Um, also, what I'd suggest is that any school should offer some kind of transition event. Um, and I know that life is really busy, but please do prioritise those. They're there for a reason and we pick really carefully when they are in the school calendar. So please do make sure that your child attends them and try to support them to make close links um, at those events. Because what would be ideal is that if they make just a few friends in their new setting, um, then you can organise, a, a, you know, your own play dates or whatever it might be, depending on their age over the summer, so they can interact socially with one another before they even set foot in the door of their new school. So those are my top tips. Thank you to the whole team for all the time and thought that's gone into tonight's presentations. And thank you to you for coming, because it's clearly a very important uh, matter, issue, consideration for all of you. And I hope that tonight has been helpful. Just to remind you, in Lent term, we will be running more in-depth seminars around some of these issues to help you understand better the advantages of co-education, in particular for, 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 for young women um, at uh, this inc incredibly important juncture as they move into senior school. I'm conscious we've been going for nearly an hour now. I hope it's been helpful. Thank you so much for tuning in and I look forward hopefully to seeing you in person before long. Thank you very much. Good night.